Ladies and gents, my name is Brandon Stover. Welcome to the How to Solve Climate Change course from Plato University. Causes, systems, obstacles, solutions to this global challenge is what you're going to learn here today. When you're ready to learn more skills, join us for free at Plato.University. Let's get started with today's lesson. We'll have our expert guests briefly introduce themselves and their credentials for why they are able to speak to this topic. Yeah, so I'm Pierre Friedrichstein, a professor at the University of Exeter in the UK. I'm also research director at CNRS in France. I've been working on global carbon cycle and coupling to the climate system for the last 25 years or so. Explain succinctly what the carbon feedback cycle is from first principles. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially, I mean, we emit a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere when we are burning fossil fuel, so burning coal, oil, and gas, and, or heating, transport, or producing energy. And all of this CO2 goes into the atmosphere. It stays in the atmosphere for, for quite some long times. I mean, hundreds of years. But it's also part of the natural carbon cycle system. So we need to understand the whole carbon cycle to understand the amount of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere, which stays in the atmosphere. So a large fraction of the CO2 goes back into the land and into the ocean. And these are carbon cycle feedbacks. Essentially, if you increase CO2 concentration in the atmosphere because you burn fossil fuel, you emit your CO2, the CO2 concentration goes up in the atmosphere. And because of this increase in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you have an increase in the flux that goes into the ocean. So the exchange of carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean increase because there is more stuff in the atmosphere. And so there is more flux going into you. And it goes into the surface of the ocean and eventually it goes into the deep ocean. Likewise on the land, forest ecosystem, for example, if you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, there is more photosynthesis, more growth of ecosystem with seeds. I mean, this is what's called the greening of the land of the earth, which by the way, climate skeptics are using to say, see, see, it's really, really good. I mean, CO2 is plant food that there's nothing to worry about. That's a different story, but so yes, I mean, CO2 does increase photosynthesis and therefore terrestrial biomass, which means that a fraction of the CO2 which we do emit into the atmosphere goes back into the land or the ocean. On the average, about half of the CO2 emitted goes back into the land in the ocean. Why does the carbon feedback cycle exist? What role does this system play in our lives? Well, it's just a natural, the, the, the carbon cycle is, 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 is a natural, I mean, feature of the earth system. And you have, I mean, forests and when, when forests grow, I mean, they take up CO2 from the atmosphere um, to put the biomass. And then eventually, I mean, the forest then will, will, will die. The tree will die, will fall down on the ground. It will start to, to, to decompose, a fraction going to the soil, the fraction is being released into the atmosphere. The decomposition of organic matter means that the CO2 is released and goes back into the atmosphere. So it's, it's a closed circle, which is the CO2 going in and CO2 going out. And when there's no perturbation from human activities, this is more or less a steady state. It's a natural system. CO2 goes into the land. From the synthesis, it goes back into the atmosphere from the composition of dead materials. Likewise, in the ocean, it goes in the ocean in high latitude where you have cold water that can take lots of CO2 and take it down in the, in the, in the deep ocean. In the tropics, you have large mass water going back to the surface from the deep ocean. They bring back lots of nutrients. They bring back lots of carbon and the carbon is eventually released to the atmosphere. So again, it's a close system. CO2 going into the ocean and going out of the ocean. At steady state, before human interventions and perturbation of the system, it was more or less stable. How does the carbon feedback cycle interact with the problem of climate change? If you look at them I in the long term, high score data, you see that the CO2 is relatively stable. But since, let's say, at least, I mean, five, five, five thousand years, 10,000 years, the CO2 has been relatively st stable in the atmosphere until last century when we start emitting CO2 meaning the CO2 went up in the atmosphere. And then this all natural carbon cycle system that were a steady state until now starts responding to this perturbation. They start absorbing CO2. The climate is warming. Warming of the climate also has an impact on the carbon cycle. So there's a second type of feedback, which is if you have large warming, you reduce the flux of CO2 that goes into the ocean. So I said the CO2 goes into the ocean because the CO2 is increasing. But there's less CO2 going to the ocean now because 
the, the, the ocean is are warming as well. And the warming of the ocean reduces the uptake of carbon from the ocean. So they still take CO2, but they would they take less than if there was no warming. And likewise on land, I mean, I mean land ecosystem and forest mainly, uh, take less CO2 because of warming. Because warming leads to increase the composition and the respiration for microbial activity in the soil. So the, the carbon doesn't stay in the soil as long as it would be if there was no warming. So the land ecosystem are still taking CO2, but like as, as, as for the ocean, they, still, they take a bit less now that they would take if there was no warming. Well, you have positive and negative feedbacks in the system. You have a perturbation, but the perturbation is kind of reduced in intensity thanks to these things. If there was no land or ocean sink, the, the constraint of the atmosphere today would be twice as large as it is already. And we would be well above, well, two degrees of warming already. But thanks to this land and ocean, they are removing a fraction, a large fraction, about 50% of the perturbation. So they tend to reduce the speed of the perturbation. But at the same time, the warming doesn't help because the warming reduces the, the efficiency of these land and ocean sinks. So they're still functioning, but at a reduced rate compared to an ideal world where you would have only CO2 increase and no warming. How might we positively influence this system to help solve climate change? The first, I mean, obvious way, of course, is to reduce emissions. I mean, the, I mean, the faster we do reduce emissions, the faster we will reduce the warming and the impact of warming on, well, everything, human systems, and but also ecosystems and, I mean, land and marine ecosystems. So reducing the warming is, or reducing the density of the, the future warming, is, as I would say, is, is, is the most important thing to do. And to do this, you have to reduce emissions as quickly as possible. Of course, what we also do at the moment is deforestation, meaning the tropics, and that really doesn't help because not only deforestation means that we emit CO2 to the atmosphere because we're cutting trees, then these trees of forest were storing loads of carbon, and now the carbon is being left on the ground for use, and it's eventually being released to the atmosphere, and the forests are being replaced by I mean, pastures of croplands that can store much, much less carbon. But, but not only we release CO2 to the atmosphere, but also we reduce the amount of forest on, on other earths and forests are critically important because these are the place where you have this land carbon sinks. So if we reduce the forest, we also reduce the efficiency of the system to remove CO2. So not only we add more CO2 because we cut the forest, but we reduce the sink capacity of the earth. It's a double negative impact if you want. So the first thing to do, I mean, well, at the same time as reducing emission from fossil fuel is also to reduce deforestation as quickly as possible. What are the best resources to learn more about the carbon feedback cycle in relation to climate change? The best resource, I mean, in general, when we talk about climate, is IPCC, and it's so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and this is the case as well for the carbon cycle. The first one was in 1990, and there's like a report every six, seven years on the average. And since the third report that was published in 2001, there is a specific chapter on the carbon cycle. There was one in the, in the, in the fourth assessment, the fifth assessment, and the, the last one, the sixth assessment that was published last year, has a, has a, a long chapter. It's about 700 pages long on the carbon cycle. It tells us everything you want to know about the carbon cycle. The long-term view from the paleo, the ice core data, and the up and down in the glacial cycle up to the present day, the understanding of the current carbon cycle and future projection on the fate of the carbon cycle in the future due to warming. Right now, you're speaking to passionate students who want to actually solve problems like these. What top three skills should they study so that they actually have the ability to do so? That's a top question. I mean, I'm talking to students that are like, I mean, math students, or I mean, I mean, environmental science students, so they're scientists. Uh, I don't teach to, I mean, students working on a different field, like sociology, for example, psychology, which is equally important, I mean, to, I mean, to understand that and, and the, way, the way we need to I mean, respond to these stress. So for my students, it's about numerical skills. It's, it's, and modeling, it's, it's really important because the last fraction of what we do, at least again, what, what I'm doing with my students, it's on modeling of the climate system, modeling of the carbon cycle, trying to represent with numerical equation, the behavior of the system. So there was a lot of mass, a lot of statistics, lots of yeah, numerical modeling and coding and well, machine learning now and, and AI more and more, of course, because there's lots and lots of observation data that we need to use and, and deal with and try to incorporate, I mean, as wisely as possible in, in global climate models. Any final recommendations for the audience? Well, my recommendation would be that there's lots of stuff on social media going in all directions from 
I mean, total, I mean, climate skepticism and denial. I mean, nothing, nothing is happening or it's not us or we, there's nothing we can do, which is wrong. And there's also a growing level of climate doomism in a sense, like there's nothing we can do, it's too late. And these, all of these feedback I mentioned, they will make the whole system totally unmanageable and there's nothing we can do anymore. And I mean, none of this position is true. I mean, of course, a lot of I mean, climate change is happening already. I mean, a lot of climate impact are happening already across the world. I mean, we see this like every, I wouldn't say every day, but I mean, actually like every month, there's something happening in some place in the world where there's like some kind of extremes, which is happening now and which is like unheard of before. So, and we have to be prepared and to be, I mean, to adapt for more in the future, that's for sure. But still, I mean, we can still limit the damage and every reduction in the emissions will help. And if we can reduce as much as possible, and even if we can't limit warming to 1.5 degrees, and if it's 1.6 or 1.7, it's still infinitely better than not doing anything and letting the system continue to warm for the rest of the century. So let's not give up. Thank you, Pierre. In today's lesson, Pierre spoke about feedback loops associated with the carbon feedback cycle. To further your understanding and practice skills related to this topic, your activity is to practice conducting a feedback loop analysis. Choose a specific climate-related scenario involving both positive and negative feedback loops. Research the components of these feedback loops and how they interact. Then create a written analysis or visual representation that explains the feedback mechanisms and their potential implications for the climate system. Thank you for taking the How to Solve Climate Change course. If you want to learn the skills to solve this global challenge, join us for free at Plato.University for exclusive content, extra resources, and actionable exercises with every lesson. This course was produced by Plato University, where students turn passions into purpose and learn skills to change the world. Learn more at Plato.University.